Now, getting back to NSA spying information, Ars Technica has an article about how a 30-year-old, in this case a lawyer, exposed NSA mass surveillance of Americans. But it's not the 30-year-old Ed Snowden. No, this was a lawyer, and it was back in 1975, eight years before Ed Snowden was born. And this was part of the Frank Church Committee hearings, if you remember back in the mid-70s. It was an effort to clean up corruption in the wake of Watergate. The article says, critics today charge that the U.S. surveillance state has become a self-perpetuating insular leviathan that essentially makes its own rules under minimal oversight. Absolutely. Well, the church committee, set up by Congress in 1975 to function as a sort of Watergate-style inquiry, focused on CIA subversion of foreign governments and spying on American citizens. Now, the 30-year-old lawyer that they talk about in this article is an L. Britt Snyder. And what he was talking about was Project Shamrock. Now, listen to how similar this is, even though the technology has changed. He said, I can remember the clean-cut, earnest man in his early 40s who met with me, but I do not recall his name. It was true, he said, that NSA had access for many years, even in 1975, to most of the international telegrams leaving New York City for foreign destinations. It was just telegrams then. The program was codenamed Shamrock, and it was known to only a few people within the government. Every day a courier went up to New York on the train and returned to Fort Meade, that's where the NSA was headquartered, with large reels of magnetic tape, which were copies of the international telegrams sent from New York the preceding day using the facilities of three telegraph companies. The tapes would then be electronically processed for items of foreign intelligence interest, typically telegrams sent by foreign establishments in the U.S., or telegrams that appeared to be encrypted. It's exactly, exactly what they are doing today. Except, as we'll see in the uh, one article after this, we're going to see exactly how they're doing that from Google and Apple and how technology has streamlined that and made that so pervasive that they can do it to everyone. But first, let's take a look at the reaction in Germany. German prosecutors may actually file charges over U.S. and British surveillance. They're very angry about the fact that the German government has been spied upon. German Justice Minister Sabine Leutasser Schnarrenberger demanded an immediate explanation and said the behavior of the intelligence services was, quote, reminiscent of the actions against enemies during the Cold War. Quote, it defies belief that our friends in the U.S. see Europeans as their enemies, she said. A spokesman for the federal prosecutor said the office was preparing to bring charges against, quote, persons unknown in relation to the reports. Well, we know who they are. They can start with James Clapper, director of intelligence, who lied to Congress just a couple of months before this was all broken by Snowden. He lied to Congress about what was being collected. We can also go to uh, President Obama himself. Maybe they should press charges against Obama. But the interesting thing, I think, about it is the fact that they just cannot believe how they're being treated. They have no malice towards the United States, yet the United States is treating them as if they're enemies. Well, that's the situation we American citizens find ourselves in. Not bearing any malice in general to the United States government, we are treated as if we were dangerous enemies. We are spied on, we are lied to, and we see a buildup in weapons reminiscent of the Cold War. So essentially what we see here is an information war, a PSYOP, that has all the hallmarks of a Cold War and preparations for a hot war. Now the government likes to say that, uh, like to minimize these, this NSA leak and say, we were just looking at ones and zeros, or it's just metadata. Well, more slides have been released today from The Independent, more slides from Edward Snowden, that give us more information about PRISM. And if you remember when this came out a couple of weeks ago now, the companies that were involved, Microsoft, Google, Apple, others, said essentially the same thing in their statements. They had very carefully worded, nearly identical statements of denial, which right there should tell you that they're not telling the truth, that they've got a prepared statement, carefully prepared denial, so they can kind of beat around the bush. Actually, I guess you'd say they're prevaricating around the bush. But these identical scripted statements were denials. And now we see in this document here that you're looking at, we see exactly what's happening. These are some more documents from this top secret slideshow that was leaked by Edward Snowden. 
The slide describes what happens when an NSA analyst, quote, tasks the PRISM system, in other words, gives it a task, for information about a new surveillance target. And they've got about 117,000 of these targets as of last count. The request to add a new target is passed automatically to a supervisor who reviews it. But basically, it's just a rubber stamp procedure because the analyst only has to have, in his terms, a reasonable belief defined as 51% confidence that the specified target is a foreign national. Now, the other things that are interesting are these side notes on these charts. Go down that chart just a little bit, and you'll see that side note over to the, to the side. The Washington Post says, the FBI uses government equipment on private company property to retrieve matching information from a participating company, such as Microsoft or Yahoo, and it then passes it on without further notice or further review to the NSA. If you look at the next slide down, you'll see that it shows how it passes from the cloud to the FBI Data Intercept Technology Unit. That's the DITU. And it says in the notes there, from the FBI's interception unit on the premises of private companies. Again, they said, we don't know anything about it. We didn't have anything to do with it. They've actually got the machines there. And we've had leakers who have told us this in the past, and they were telling us this from the very beginning. And now we have more evidence from the government's own top secret slides that it is on the private company's premises that they put this specialized equipment where they can pass information to one or more quote unquote customers as they call themselves. Those customers would be the NSA, the CIA, or the FBI. Now the next slide shows that depending on the provider, the NSA may receive live notifications when a target logs in or sends an email or monitors a voice text or voice chat as it is happening. So right there, there's the note right there. They're going to be pulling in the data in real time as it's happening. And if we look at the previous uh, chart that was up there, one of the things that they like to talk about is how it's, go to the previous chart there, talk about metadata and how it's, don't worry, it's only metadata. Or as one congressman said, it's only ones and zeros. It's not any information about you. But on that chart, it shows not only metadata, but it shows voice content right there. You see voice content. Down a little bit to the left, guys, it says DNI content, in other words, where you're located, and videos. They're looking at all of your personal information. It is not just metadata. Now, we have an interview that is coming up with the filmmakers of State of Mind, talking about control and how the government has absolute total control of us. Part of total control, part of a psyops, is having information about what you're doing, how you're going to react, how you think. Then they use that information to control you. This is an excellent documentary, State of Mind. It's going to be shipping July 17th. It is still pre-booking at InfoWars. We're going to have it exclusively for a 90-day window here at InfoWars. And we've got an, a uh, video here where Alex is meeting with the filmmakers, and they talk about how subjective reality is manipulated to influence our objective reality. Okay, folks, Alex Jones here with InfoWars.com, and we're shooting some interviews uh, to get the word out about the new film, State of Mind, The Psychology of Control, that people can find out more about uh, at InfoWars.com, InfoWarsStore.com. And we're going to be premiering this on PrisonPlanet.tv uh, on July 17th, uh, 7 o'clock Central, for all the viewers and members of PrisonPlanet.tv. And then they are graciously, to get the word out and have a free society, are going to allow it to be posted uh, on our official YouTube channel for free for everybody. But I hope that folks out there will want to have it on Blu-ray or DVD and get a free film that we're offering with it at InfoWarsStore.com so that they can make future films. This is their second feature film. The first one, of course, uh, is A Noble Lie, Oklahoma City, 1995, exposing that false flag. So this is very important to support the front lines of the InfoWar, and I'm very impressed with this film. That's why we have the initial distribution in the first three months of it coming out. So you can pre-order it right now at InfoWarsStore.com. But we were in there having a meeting about uh, a big interview we're doing tomorrow on the Nightly News, uh, and uh, Richard Grove, who is a, a forensic historian and really knows his stuff because I've done a lot of research, uh, and you know, hearing him talk of uh, the way he puts things is, is really a great way to wake people up, but also to uh, simplify the complexity. 
and he's uh, basically taken the uh, classic equation, uh, one of the classic equations of Einstein, and combined it to basically explain how they're hijacking uh, the human computer and manipulating it, why they want us to have training instead of real education. Of course, they call their brainwashing and Pavlovian training, they call it education, but it, it's, it's really dog training, TSA, all of it. So I uh, got him to basically uh, you know, uh, agree to talk to us here and go back over what he was showing me earlier when he drew out this equation. Uh, so uh, Richard, please break this down for everybody out there. Just a little behind the scenes on what it takes to uh, come up with state of mind and the line of thinking that it takes for an individual to become autonomous again. You've heard the saying, Temen noske, know, know thyself. It comes from the Greek Delph uh, oracle Delphi. They used to go to a woman who would sniff vapors because they didn't have logic and reason yet. And when logic and reason came along, the, the oracle of Delphi became obsolete. So movies like The Matrix say that this whole place, these are uh, arguments of philosophy. How do you find reality? How do you find knowledge? How do you find wisdom and, and pass it on? Well, one of the pieces of wisdom we have as humanity is the idea of energy mass equivalence. It didn't originate with Einstein, it originated with Maxwell. But if you take this equation, which basically means one gram of any substance, any element on Earth, has the same potential energy, and you solve it for Celeritas, or the speed of light, you find that it has both positive and negative values. Now this is the same that if you had the square root of four, you would also have plus or minus two. So you have a positive and negative aspect. The positive aspect, which would be on the bottom, would be your physical or objective reality. This is where we use words particulars. If I say chair, I mean this chair, not the concept or universal of all chairs, right? And so we as human beings have to interact with reality, but most of our human beingness comes from our mind. So this is where we keep knowledge, uh, these universal concepts, this is subjective experience. That's the archetypes they're programming. Right, absolutely. And you also have to synchronize yourself to stay in, in line with reality. So the objective reality or these particulars, you need a way to you know, test it, to test it, to synchronize it, just uh, like you uh, synchronize your devices, right? So when you're dealing with objective reality and you want to get to you know, what is the concept or what is the knowledge to be learned, you use deductive logic. And when you want to go from the concept that you've learned and take it back to reality, you use the other part of the convection current called inductive logic. So really, it's the war on in your mind. It's not a war going on out there. It's the fact that we don't understand ourselves and our, our opponents have spent a great deal of money and wealth understanding us better than we have gained uh, knowledge of ourselves at this point. Now the education system plays into it because it behooves corporate society for people not to be able to synchronize. They want to control your ideas up here and they don't want you to use your five senses and observe down here. And it's through observation, identification, organization, and then communication that we can find valid knowledge and express it to other people as wisdom. So that's why they say questioning known liars is a conspiracy theory. That's just a fake uh, archetype up in the universal to say, don't look at your five senses, that's kooky. So basically, uh, they're trying to get people to just stay in the allegory of the cave and only believe what's projected on the wall. We're back to Plato again. And one of the challenges as a media producer is to create a piece of media that takes the audience through that transition, through that learning process, so that they can escape the cave, the metaphor of uh, being an enslaved uh, person in their mind because they don't ask questions. Recently, the, the kids at RIT, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology in upstate New York, uh, had a $12,000 Kickstarter to build a three-dimensional model of the Escherian Steps, MC Escher being a famous model who made 2D designs that looked like 3D. So the challenge was build this in reality. And a viral video went across the internet where you can see people running up and down these Asherian steps having their minds blown. And I advise everyone who's watching to take a look at that, look it up, and don't do research into how they do it, just experience the PSYOP as it is and see if you can figure it out without looking it up. But what you'll see is that their project was not to create some impossible three-dimensional staircase, it was to sell a myth to the public. It was to raise money to make people believe that they were really gonna do it. They use a vertical split screen. Uh, I, I spoiled it for everybody, we'll have to cut. No, no, just spoil it. <laughs> they use a vertical split screen so other people can basically take their iPhone, go to this stairwell, which really exists, but it's a real stairwell that only goes you know, one way and you can't go around circles, and then they can simply edit it. And the phenomenon you experience is that when these kids figure out it's a myth, they don't tell you, they participate in it. And so that's the teaching of psychological warfare skills to college students, and that's, I'm, I'm sure that's not what their parents are paying for, but it's a priceless lesson because I was able to share this with my friends and family, and they have all sorts of ideas about how it's done, and when I tell them it's psychological warfare, when I explain it's a myth that they're creating, 
they take a step back. And I'm like, that's just what they did on 9-11. It's what they do on every And that's what they teach you about uh, things like uh, you know, Christmas really being Santa Claus, and you lie to your kids right. and be part of the myth. Right, and that's part of social conditioning. I mean, uh, I know it's a gross topic, but there's a, a really great documentary on circumcision and how that brutal practice came into this country. And when you find out it's about breaking down the male and the family and social control, and if a father will do that to his only child or you know, firstborn son, then society can really control that father to do anything, can't they? Absolutely, they can make you engage in sexual mutilation then you'll accept anything else. If you can let the TSA stick their hands down your pants, then you'll accept anything. If you'll let them take blood at warrantless checkpoints, you'll do anything. Predictive programming. Predictive programming. And so it's the use of cybernetics and technology to harness human spirits, which are subjective. They are universals. They use technology in the real world to try to take away our humanity. They have to dehumanize other people on the other side of the world for us to say, rah, rah, send that money to buy jets and bomb them or use drones. And people in America have to believe that those people on the other side of the world who might not look like us are bad people, that they're not human beings because they want to use depleted uranium and white phosphorus and all these crazy things that our tax dollars unwittingly, I mean, none of us really agree to that. And yet well, that's like man-made global warming. Undoubtedly, right. some of the things we do to the earth are hurting the earth and us but it's certainly not carbon dioxide. But they say, Obama yesterday, the bad weather was because you didn't pay the UN money. And, and it's going back to the ancient myths of, give me the best hut, give me the best food, let me sacrifice your children, or the snake god's gonna eat the moon tomorrow. The scientists knew that it was really an eclipse. They knew it came back. And, but, but they knew the general public didn't mark down the dates didn't remember, so they thought the priests were magic, and now they've come back to accept world government. Let us charge you more for everything. Let us let us make you pay private interest a global tax of a hundred trillion over the next decade, as they're calling for uh, at Davos, or this or the Earth will basically die. While they actually engage in things that are hurting the Earth, and that becomes the real delusion when you study these globalists. They're the ones that are actually endangering everything, and they're drinking their own Kool-Aid as well. They're not only drinking their own Kool-Aid, but they fail to recognize the fact that they are drinking Kool-Aid. And the, you know, the things that are going on right now are not new. It's just that we're at, a, we're at a point in history where we can afford the technology to easily share this with millions of people. And times in the past, you could tell a couple people, and then they'll probably wipe you out, take all your stuff, and never be heard from again, because they write history. So you're really dealing with a well-organized opponent with a lot of office supplies that keep records back thousands of years. You know, we have a very short memory in this country. People in Europe aren't so easily controlled so much because they've been part of a system that's been controlled. We were groomed to think that we live in a free country. That has not been true for a long time, but it could be true again. These ideas that made America great are still here. They've just been conditioned out of us. They've bred the liberty, self-reliance, self-confidence, and freedom out of us. And they've taught us to externalize all these things through conspicuous consumption. Buy a, buy a fancy car, get respect from people. Have a high paying job, get respect from people. Well, those are some of the things that I had trouble with when I left the you know, corporate world. When I retired as a whistleblower, I got to give up my big apartment, my Range Rover, my Porsche. I haven't had a car, a cell phone, a bank card in 10 years. I'm just fine. The clothes I'm wearing, uh, this jacket I bought in 1997, it's still fine. You, you have to look at world, at, at world affairs and yourself and how you interact with Well, the integrity is the value, exactly. not the signets of success. Again, that's all just surface or universal programming instead of what real value is. Well, and one of the differences today with universal programming is this idea of cybernetics. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski uh, in... Uh, between two ages, the technotronic era, which means the post-industrial world in America. He says that the deindustrialization of America is planned because they had this thing called cybernetics where they could collect all this information. And under the Soviet Union, it wasn't as effective because they had no computing power to process it and make profiles and predict people's behavior. But today, everything that's going on with the NSA spying is stuff that Brzezinski called for in 1970 to say, if you want to control this human livestock, you have to start collecting massive amounts of information and applying and developing technological artificial intelligence to do something with that to control their attention and make sure that uh, no one can damage us so we can be better managed, which is a crime against the species and everyone and shows how degenerate these people are. It's not like they're lions going out eating gazelles because that's the order of things. They are wrecking the species to make us gazelles so they can act like lions when they're not even really lions. Uh, they are people that on a mass scale are cheating themselves and everyone else. And that's why it's important that, that the fire of liberty uh, 
get out there across the entire world. And that's why films like State of Mind are important. I hope you get it at InfoWarsStore.com. I hope you start thinking for yourself. Uh, because these people are laughing at you. So many folks that learn about this knowledge decide to use it to manipulate people so that they can, again, have more empty uh, you know, logos of power, a bigger house, a nicer car. When in truth, if you have this knowledge and use it for good to empower people, you can become monetarily successful. But then you realize that's only a tool or fuel to try to build a better civilization because that's the real continuum we're part of is trying to be a healthy species in a future, not one run by a bunch of crazy technocrats. And so I just hope that everybody out there understands that I've been approached many times off record, but also sometimes on record, and they say, look, the public scum, you're smart, you see it, join us. That's what they tell a lot of these people, and then on the ego, they go, oh, I can be part of the club, and it's all just a sick, narcissistic joke, ladies and gentlemen. The, the people in the greatest depths of the matrix are those that think they're going to manage and control all of this. And so that's the point I want to make to you out there, is that, this knowledge is a fact. What's going on with the New World Order is a spoken fact. They write books, like Brzezinski, I've read a couple of his books where he you know, brags about all this evil and admits they run the organized crime and admits they you know, are managing everything. And you've got to understand that Rothkopf you know, writes and talks about this. All their insiders think you're so stupid, they write books just for themselves to read it, kind of like Carol Quigley wrote tragedy and hope just to give to people the State Department so they can understand, wait, we're fascist, but we run communism? Well, wait, we want authoritarianism? Well, wait. They themselves have to have these publications so they can understand the twisted logic. And then if you look at who it's actually, Rachel Maddow was a Rhodes Scholar. MSNBC is owned by GE and they produce nuclear weapons. They're every part of the New World Order. So when a Rhodes Scholar is attacking you on a regular basis, I'd say you're successful. Well, you notice she likes to play the part of an anti-tyrant person when Bush was in, but you notice that Naomi Wolf has come out against Snowden and says, I feel like he might be a double Naomi agent. Naomi a Rhodes Scholar as well. I know, that's why I brought her up. Yeah. So and, and, it, and, it, and it's regardless of who Snowden really is. He didn't give out missile secrets or aircraft carrier speeds. He said what we already knew, but just said that, and, and now they're talking about wanting him dead. And, 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 and saying arrest him, and then, and then all these people are saying he might be an agent or something because the media is spinning it. They're going to do that anyways. Yeah. Justice be done, may the heavens fall. But you can see all these people who just think they're smarter than us trying to manage us. And they're intellectually bankrupt. That's the most important point to take away. Review anything, the, the attack pieces that corporate media does on Alex. They can never address the, the reasonable points that are being made, the, legit, the legitimate documents that are out there. They always have to go after something and go get some video of him from 10 years ago, make it look like he's in this little tiny studio. You know, they do not give him respect as they should because they know it's a threat. That well, she lies and says that I'm saying there's WASP under the I UN or that Obama sent uh, the tornado when a lady said, are there weather weapons? And I said, of course there are. I don't think this is a weather weapon. That turns into, I said Obama did it. But that's desperateness. Right. I mean, they are desperate. Right. And if anyone wants to look it up, weather weapons, December 10th, 1976, there's a United Nations treaty against weather weapons, weather modification banned in that treaty. So the United Absolutely. Nations knows it exists. We should too. It was a giant geoengineering program. But again, state of mind, support, free, open film. Get this out to everybody, and regardless, uh, watch it on the 17th, and then later it's going to be uh, on YouTube, uh, and, and understand this is a gift for all of our future. So again, Alex Jones signing off, uh, here with the great folks from Free Minds Films. Now get out there and take on the New World Order, because there is a war on for your mind, and knowing about it is half the battle.